Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ACES webinar, the second in our series. We're here um, with Stanley Fishbein, who will be presenting um, his webinar from the first in the series. And we'll go ahead. I'll do a short intro. I just want to tell everyone a little bit more about the American Solar Energy Society. Um, we are a nonprofit. We're founded in 1954, working to advance renewable energy. Um, and we would really like your support. You can join ACES at aces.org slash join at any point. Um, and we are offering a promotional code for everyone to get 25% off a professional ACES membership using promo code ACES webinar, all one word. And you can use that code when you join at aces.org slash join. The promo code um, will be live up through until the end of the weekend. Um, we'd also like to invite everyone to participate directly within the webinar in the chat room. You can also add questions to the Q&A. Also, uh, we do have a handouts section with a handful of handouts that are available to you uh, that Stanley has provided uh, for us, um, including a little bit more about Stan, um, some contact information for him, a cash flow that he'll be going over later on in the webinar, um, some other Q&As that you might want to look over. So feel free to check out the handout section at any point in time. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and um, introduce Mr. Fishbein, who is the managing partner at Cleanview Capital, an equipment fan finance company that specializes in providing leases and loans to commercial and industrial companies nationwide for the acquisition of solar systems. With more than 35 years of diversified equipment leasing experience, Mr. Fishbein has held positions in the commercial equipment leasing subsidiaries of ABN Amro Bank, Chrysler Corporation, Citibank, and Textron Corporation. He holds a Master of Law degree in Taxation from Boston University School of Law, a Juris Doctorate degree from Suffolk University Law School, and a degree in Accounting from the University of Massachusetts. So I will go ahead and we'll start the presentation video for you all, and then we will go ahead and hop into Q&A with Stan afterwards. Please enjoy. Okay, Folks, thank you, Carly, for that for that nice introduction. introduction. And thank you, American Solar Energy Society, for the opportunity to speak today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in the American Solar Energy Society's new webinar series. We all share a common goal of promoting the adoption and use of the world's most abundant energy source. So I hope you find today's session to be educational as well as helpful in increasing solar system sales. Let's start by looking at today's agenda. Since we each got involved with solar in different ways, I thought it might be interesting to share with you my story. I will then discuss a business owner's objectives when considering solar for his or her company and how to distinguish yourself from your competition. After a review of basic selling skills, I will then define a lease in simple terms and explain how a traditional operating lease may be used as a de facto method of financing. I will explain why capturing the monetized value of the federal income tax credit is the number one problem for most privately owned companies and how the traditional operating lease solves this problem and helps customers achieve objectives that are not addressed by power purchase agreements or solar industry leases. My review of traditional operating lease features and the benefits derived by customers will then be followed by a comparison of the cost of ownership when using a traditional lease versus a loan. I will then be glad to answer questions after my presentation. First up, my background. As a big believer in education, I became a tax lawyer and accountant and spent my first career developing income tax strategies for clients. This led to 35 years in the commercial equipment leasing industry, where I utilized my knowledge and experience to provide optimized financing solutions to clients acquiring various types of equipment. 
While networking with energy professionals, I met Wilden Fishman, founder and president of the New York Solar Energy Society. NISIS, as it is known, is a chapter of ASIS, the American Solar Energy Society. I joined the NISIS Board of Directors, and over the past 10 years, I have to tell you, I have learned a lot about solar and renewable energy in general, as well as climate problems and solutions. So if you are interested in these topics, I highly recommend you join ACES and a local chapter. Your financial support and active involvement will be mutually rewarding, I assure you. My popular presentation at NISIS events, Making Solar Affordable, was the basis for the Clean Energy Ownership Program, a program that I created for companies seeking more value from solar than available from solar industry programs, as well as an affordable path to solar ownership. The linchpin of the program is the traditional operating lease provided by a federally regulated bank with more than 50 billion in assets. So, as more companies want to show off solar installations to their customers, it is becoming easier for you to get a meeting. Once you have your foot in the door, however, it is best to keep in mind a company's primary objectives, grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. Grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. At your meeting, your prospective customer will expect to hear how they can use solar to reduce their electric expense. Do that and give them more. Why? Because savvy business owners want more value than just cost reduction. Trust me. I've heard people say customers maximize value when from solar by paying cash. Those folks don't realize, however, that most privately owned companies in the U.S. today are tax pass-through entities and therefore cannot use an income tax credit. Making matters worse is the fact that many company owners also cannot use a tax credit because they have good accountants that have implemented various tax planning strategies. However, even when the tax credit can be used by company owners on their personal tax returns, conserving cash in the business rather than saving personal income taxes is usually a higher priority. That's what company owners tell me all the time. Why is this? Because it doesn't make good business sense for most companies to tie up cash in any type of long-lived equipment or obtain tax savings outside the company when that cash can be used to grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. There are two examples that I use to demonstrate how conserving cash in the business can achieve company objectives. First, companies working with a bank line of credit will reduce interest costs, thereby increase profit, when more cash in the business will reduce the need to draw down a bank line to fund operations. And more cash in the company helps maintain balance sheet compliance ratios required by the bank line. The second example is even more compelling. Assume that a company has a 20% profit margin and turns its inventory twice a year. Would you want to tie up cash and equipment or earn a 40% annual return on that cash when you invest it in inventory? I think the answer is a no brainer. And by using the traditional operating lease as an affordable path to ownership, the company still enjoys solar energy savings. It's like that old expression, having your cake and eating it too. So you have the opportunity to distinguish yourself from your competition by demonstrating more value to potential customers. What are you going to do? Your first objective is to develop a relationship as a trusted consultant. By taking a holistic approach to all of your customers' objectives, and not simply pitching energy cost reduction. A key first step is to ask a lot of questions. Who are the company owners? Who is the decision maker? Is the company a tax pass-through entity? 
who, if anyone, can obtain value from a tax credit? Is the company owner a tax-exempt entity, such as an ESOP, that's an employee stock ownership plan, that cannot use a tax credit, or a company that has a large research and development tax credit carry forward that also would be precluded from using the solar tax credit? Who owns the realty on which the solar system will be installed? Are there capital budget limitations? What are the other needs or uses for cash in the business? Another good question to add to the list, the most company owners will answer, by the way, is how much is your company's annual sales revenue? The answer will be an early indicator for what size project the company could possibly afford, and therefore just as important to know as how many panels you can fit on the roof. Selling 101. It's all about basic sales principles. Basic sales principle number one, ask a lot of questions, as we just saw on the previous slide. Ask a lot of questions because the answers will help you formulate an effective presentation, including a proposal and cash flow projection that will be appropriate for the customer's situation. Know your customer is another basic sales principle, by the way. The cash flow will show how the value of tax benefits comes together with any available local, state, or utility incentives and an appropriate financing method to make ownership of the solar system affordable and profitable for that customer. Your proposal should be concise and to avoid confusion, not include a comparison of more than two financing alternatives. Knowing the benefits of each and how they apply to a customer's situation will support your recommendation of the one that will optimize value as opposed to maximize, optimize value and best achieve your customer's objectives. Another way to differentiate yourself from your competition is to understand and use business terminology. For example, net present value of cash flow demonstrates an immediate increase in the value of realty as soon as the attached solar system is switched on and is considered by CFOs to be superior to payback as a measure of return on investment. A Harvard Business Review article about NPV is on the CleanView Capital's website if you're interested in learning more about NPV. It's a very effective measure uh, to consider. If the customer says, come back next year because there's no money in the budget, overcome that objection by asking if it is the CapEx budget he is referring to. And if so, point out that operating lease payments will be made from the operating budget not the CapEx budget, the operating budget where there could be more money as well as where there is a better matching of lease payments to energy savings. Also important to understand is income tax credit and depreciation rules and why levelized cost of energy over the life of the solar system rather than over the term of the financing is the appropriate metric. Knowledge of financing program features as well as benefits will help you quickly answer customer questions and overcome objections before they fester and create a roadblock in the selling process. To be successful in selling commercial solar, however, you do not have to memorize everything if you have good substantive written material and people to support you. For example, at CleanView Capital, we supply solar sales professionals with detailed written material that includes lease structure, tax and accounting treatment, application and approval process, and frequently asked questions and answers. In addition to clearly communicating the environmental and financial benefits of acquiring a solar system, you should explain how the financing you recommend will benefit the company's broader objectives grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. Always stress the benefits, the benefits, and don't forget to ask for the check, meaning know when to stop selling and close the sale. 
Okay, time to dig, time to dive deeper into today's subject matter. What is a lease? A lease is a rental agreement whereby the lessee pays rent to the property owner, known as the lessor, to use the property for a period of time known as the lease term. Either a purchase option is exercised or the property must be returned. The lessee is not borrowing money, so no interest is paid. Rental payments are, as a result, 100% tax deductible as a business expense. This definition of true lease is applicable whether leasing a car, a solar system, or any type any other type of property for that matter. Operating lease is the accounting terminology for a true lease. I refer to it as a traditional operating lease to distinguish it from the solar industry lease, which has been loaded up with additional features to make it similar to a power purchase agreement in terms of allocation of value between two parties. A capital lease is accounting terminology for a financing. It has an implicit interest rate and is treated like a loan for accounting and tax purposes. So I hope I've uh, shared with you this basic definition uh, because a lot of people get confused with the various lease terminology that's uh, used. Okay, so de facto method of financing. A lease can be used to eliminate upfront capital investment and provide an affordable path to ownership. In this way, a traditional operating lease with an attractive purchase option will not technically be a financing, but may serve as a de facto method of financing a company's acquisition of any type of property, including solar. This has been an acceptable technique for more than 40 years. More on this in a minute when I share with you an example from 1980 when leasing was used to solve a nationwide tax credit monetization problem. Customers prefer a quick path to ownership because ownership is their goal. Tax credit monetization. Let's first talk about tax credit monetization as why, and why it is a dual problem. Limited liability companies, S corporations and partnerships cannot use a federal income tax credit because they don't pay income taxes. So there's no tax that can be offset with the credit. These so-called tax pass-through entities pass their taxable income and any tax credit to their owners in proportion to each owner's ownership interest. Some owners may be able to use a tax credit on their personal income tax return, while others may not, resulting in a loss of value. However, even when owners can use the tax credit, personal tax savings do not conserve cash within the business. We're needed to grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. This is a huge problem because most companies in the U.S. today are tax pass-through entities. The solution to this problem is the operating lease. When the lessor monetizes the tax credit and shares the value with the lessee by subsidizing the lessee's payments, value is optimized within the business. So the traditional operating lease is an efficient, acceptable method used to monetize tax benefits and share that value between two parties, between a lessor and lessee. It solves the tax credit monetization problem for companies that cannot use a tax credit for a variety of reasons, including U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies, subsidiaries of tax-exempt entities such as an employee stock ownership plan, and companies with large carryovers of research and development tax credits in addition to the common tax pass-through entity. A quick example of leasing as an acceptable technique to monetize and share tax benefit value was during an economic recession 40 years ago, when in 1980, the US Congress passed a 
investment tax credit for all business equipment as a way to increase capital spending and boost the economy. Recognizing that many companies at that time could not use a tax credit because they were not profitable and did not owe income taxes, the tax legislation included leasing as the prescribed method for a profitable company to be the owner lessor and share the monetized value of the tax credit by subsidizing the lessee's payments. Fast forward 40 years to today, and leasing remains an efficient method to, op to monetize and share tax benefit value between two parties. And the document is still only just several pages long. Okay, let's talk about traditional operating lease features. The lease covers 100% of project cost. No interest is paid by the lessee. The monthly payments are fixed and there's no escalation. The value of lessor's tax benefits, ITC and depreciation, is used to subsidize the lessee's lease payments, which is why the combination of the lessee's lease payments and end of term purchase will be less than project cost. Typically in the market today, we're seeing only 86 to 89% of solar project costs being the total of those lease payments and end of term purchase. So there's no interest being paid. The lessee customer is not even paying full project cost, only about 88 cents on the dollar. And all of the lessee's payments are 100% tax deductible as ordinary business expense. The monthly payments as the ordinary business expense and the purchase price actually will be written off using depreciation. The bottom line is the resulting in the creation of an affordable path to ownership. Customer benefits. When using the traditional operating lease, the customer keeps all energy savings and keeps any utility, local and state incentive payments. In addition to sharing in the value of lessor's tax benefits, the customer has its own valuable tax benefits, the 100% tax deduction of monthly lease payments and depreciation of its end of lease purchase price. Yes, companies are allowed to depreciate used as well as new property acquired for the business. As a result, the customer has greater energy savings and more overall value than available from a power purchase agreement or solar industry lease. Cash conserved in the lessee's company will be used to grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. Okay, let's look at the ownership cost comparison of the traditional operating lease versus a capital lease. This is an eye opener because it dispels the notion that the customer is giving up a lot of value to the lessor when the lessor takes the federal income tax credit and initial depreciation deduction. Indeed, based upon a $1 million solar system and lease terms currently available in today's market, this comparison demonstrates that customers retain more cash in the business and achieve a lower after-tax cost of ownership when using a traditional operating lease as a path to ownership. On the left-hand side of the ledger, the operating lease uh, has a monthly uh, payment of 8,500 a month. Uh, seven years of payments will total $714,000 and the buyout at the end for $150,000 makes the customer's all-in payments $864,000. On the right-hand side, the capital lease, also known as a loan, the monthly payments are significantly higher than on the operating lease. And after 84 payments, the total paid in is the $1 million that was borrowed plus interest of 252524 
for a total all-in payment of $1,252,524. So the total payments for the operating lease saves or conserves, I should say, $388,000 more in the business by doing the operating lease rather than the capital lease alone. That's a significant amount of money that can be put to work uh, for work to grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. Here's the real eye opener in this comparison is what happens on an after-tax basis. On the operating lease, left-hand side of the leisure, the tax credit is not monetized by the lessee. The 714,000 in monthly lease payments deducted at a 21% uh, income tax rate will save $149,940 in income taxes. When the customer purchases the system for $150,000 at the end of the lease, times 21%, writing off that purchase using maker's depreciation, the tax savings will be $31,500. For you subtract those two line item tax savings from the total paid and the after-tax cost of ownership for this customer using the operating lease is $682,560. On the right side of the ledger, the customer will be claiming the tax credit. And here we assume uh, the customer can use the full 30% tax credit, which will save 300,000 in income taxes. The interest portion of the monthly payments is tax deductible times 21% saves $53,030 in taxes, and the customer will take the initial depreciation on the solar system, which as you probably know, uh, the calculation uh, to be used first reduces the uh, lease amount by 50% of the tax credit, uh, which in this example leaves 85% of the lease amount as the so-called depreciable basis, what the customer is allowed to depreciate. So in this example, $850,000 times 21% tax rate will save $178,500 in income taxes. When you deduct those three uh, tax savings items from the total payment of a million two, the Net after-tax cost for the customer to own this solar system is seven hundred twenty thousand nine ninety-four. It's roughly a thirty-eight thousand dollar difference. So, by using the operating lease as an affordable path to ownership, rather than take ownership from the get-go, the customer's all-in cost of ownership on an after-tax basis will save $38,000 for this customer. That's the eye opener. And uh, you should see the expressions on faces uh, in the audience when I've presented this at solar conferences around the country. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Several handouts with more information have been uploaded to the handout section of the chat room. I will answer questions as time permits. If, however, we do run out of time, feel free to contact me. We are now ready for Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Stan, for redoing your presentation for us today, for reviewing that with us today. Go ahead and uh, Stanley, are you ready for some questions? Go ahead and start out asking uh, the first question that we have here with Stan. Uh, the question that I have is, how do I sell a solar system using a traditional operating lease when the monthly energy savings is less than the monthly lease payment? So from this, it looks like 
The monthly lease payment will be greater than monthly energy savings. In areas with low electric rates and no state or local incentives. However, having a monthly lease payment lower than monthly electric savings is not the objective of customers seeking optimization of energy savings as measured by levelized cost of energy over the 25 year solar system life. Stan, do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good, okay, sorry, I had a little trouble uh, just now with my connection. Um, uh, Yes, so so the, the the objective of the traditional operating lease is to provide customers with greater energy savings over the life of the system as opposed to over the term of the financing. And at the same time, uh, provide an attractive return on investment because yes, the customer will have dollars invested in order to own the system, uh, but those will be uh, worthwhile dollars invested as demonstrated by an internal rate of return or NPV statistic. And uh, to demonstrate uh, some of these points, I would like to share my screen with you uh, where you can see uh, how we present it in our cash flow model. And I'm just trying to open it up right now, if you could bear with me. And here it is. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this was uh, a, a real project for a customer in the Midwest. And if you can see my arrow, I'm not sure if you can. Carly, can you see it moving around on the screen? I can. Okay, great. So, so in the left-hand upper corner project summary, these are uh, assumptions provided to us by the solar contractor when they send in a, a cash flow request input form, uh, assuming a, in this example, a 21% uh, income tax rate, which is the current uh, corporate rate in America, a solar system of 607,464 is the project cost. And in the next column, electric rate, 13 cents, a 3% in electric inflation factor, 0.5% degradation, system size 312 kilowatt hour uh, DC, and the project cost 607,464 is the lease amount. So in other words, in essence, 100% project financing. In the next column uh, shown is the uh, summary of the seven year lease, uh, 84 monthly payments of uh, 5,000, uh, 5,000, whoops, I'm sorry, 6,000, 825, uh, I'm sorry, total monthly payments, 438,832. The payment is 5,224.19 cents a month. There are initial lease costs of 6,825, and the customer will be buying the system at the end of the seven year lease term for an amount equal to 15% of lease amount, uh, shown here is 91,120. So the customer's all in payments, is less than the project cost. It's only about 89% of project cost, or in other words, a grand total of 536,776. So right off the bat, you can see how using the traditional operating lease conserves cash on a before tax basis because the all in payments, including the buyout at the end is less than the original project cost. The next area called key financial metrics uh, highlights the reasons why your customer will want to use the traditional operating lease as an affordable path to ownership. The cumulative energy savings over the 25 year life of the system is over uh, $1.9 million. The levelized cost of energy 5.2 cents a kilowatt hour is a 60% reduction from the customer's current 13 cents a kilowatt hour electric rate. I haven't seen a PPA or solar industry lease anywhere in the US that provides the customer with a 60% energy cost reduction. At the same time, 
the customer uh, who will have money invested in ownership uh, will see that it's an attractive return on investment as measured by these two uh, metrics here, either on a net present value of the cash flow or an internal rate of return metric. Uh, customers can look either before tax or after tax, depending on how they prefer to view it. The internal rate of return, uh, 36%, and the net present value of cash flow, call it roughly a half a million dollars. So here's a project that had a cost of $607,000. As soon as the customer turns on the system, they've increased the value of their property by roughly a half a million dollars. So it's a worthwhile investment in ownership. And by using this traditional lease is an affordable path to ownership. Now, getting back to the question that Charlie asked, you know, for those customers who look at these uh, annual cash flows down below and see that the, the, the summary of the monthly payments shown here annually exceed the annual uh, savings, so their so-called negative cash flow, uh, we overcome that objection by showing this column all the way over on the right, amount invested as a percentage of project cost. So when all is said and done on an after-tax basis, the cumulative cash position of the customer, they have money invested uh, during the lease term. But how much is that? It's, it's less than 3% of project cost. And heck, the customer here is ready to invest 91120 15% uh, of lease amount to own the system at the end of the lease. So it shouldn't bother them that they have a relatively small amount invested on the way to ownership. And that's how I recommend contract is presented to overcome this objection, this knee-jerk reaction, gee, my monthly savings is, is less than my monthly payments. If that's all the customer wants, uh, I suggest they do a power purchase agreement. But if they want to optimize value over the life of the solar system, and they want greater energy savings and more overall value from solar than just minimal cost reduction, then this traditional lease is the way to go. So that's my uh, answer to your question, Carly. Thank you. And I'm happy to take other questions. Great. Yeah, in the Q&A section, there is uh, a few questions in here from a handful of people. Um, Okay, so the first one, the minimum size uh, project that we will consider is uh, $100,000. So that's, you know, roughly a 50 or 60 kW DC size system, depending on how you priced it out. $100,000 is the minimum. And uh, a lot of our projects, sweet spot is between, a, uh, say, 200000 to just under a million dollars, where there's... Uh, not a lot of attractive financing uh, programs in the marketplace. And contractors are telling us all the time we're filling a void uh, by targeting those size transactions. Good news is, by the way, we have the capacity uh, to do uh, much larger transactions up to, uh, uh, say, about $10 million. Okay, so Jim Funk asks a good question. Thought FMV at the end of the term cannot be predetermined or runs into tax law pro problem. You, you are correct, Jim. And the way we uh, avoid that is in the wording of our purchase option at the end of the seventh year, the customer has the right to buy the system at the greater of FMV or 15% or, uh, of lease amount. And we don't cap uh, fifth fair market value. And so with that kind of wording, there's no question that it passes muster if looked at by IRS. However, it always raises the concern among customers, and it's the number one question that we get all the time, is how do you determine fair market value? And basically, how do I trust you guys not to take advantage of me with some crazy off-the-wall fair market value at the end, pay up or return the system? Because they don't want to get stuck. And so to avoid 
that problem uh, with the tax attorneys at our bank, who uh, is the funder and uh, actual lessor on our transactions, uh, we created a back-end structure to completely eliminate that risk, completely eliminate that risk. And uh, um, if you want to uh, touch base with me after the webinar, um, I'm happy to go into more detail. But, but basically, uh, we provide a fixed price early buyout option at the end of the sixth year in an amount equal to 26% of lease amount. And, uh, and further state that during the sixth year, uh, the, cusp the lessee and lessor will agree on writing as to what that percentage buyout will be. And if for some crazy reason it's greater than 15%, simply buy out early at the fixed 26% and have essentially the same all-in payments as if you went full term. And uh, we go into that in more detail in writing in our customer handouts. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, offline uh, in more detail with you about that. So what's the impact of the reduction in ITC over the next few years? Uh, Marion uh, Biddle asked that question. Uh, Marion, it's going to affect the uh, pricing on uh, these transactions. Right now with a 30% ITC using the traditional operating lease, the customer's all in payments, as you might've noticed in that sample cash flow, adds up to only uh, about 89% of project costs. Reduce the value of the tax benefit that can be injected in the transaction, and, and that amount will increase from 89% to something a little bit greater. As ITC steps down over the next few years, eventually bottoming out at 10% for commercial, um, it, it will continue to increase, uh, but it will be still less than 100% of project cost and therefore still an attractive alternative uh, than going to the bank and taking out a loan where you're paying 100% of project cost plus interest. Uh, let's see, Martin uh, wants to know, are there particular brands of modules, inverters you would not finance lease? Uh, none come to mind. Uh, we're open to considering uh, all types. Okay, uh, Carly, any other questions? Sure. So how long is the traditional equipment lease document? Good question, thanks for asking. The good news is it's, it is only several pages long, unlike a PPA or solar industry lease, which is 25 or 30 pages. So the traditional equipment lease, only several pages long, it's also a generic document, and it's gonna be familiar to any uh, business person who's leased business equipment, either, such as copiers, telephone systems, or machinery. Uh, and, and the good news there is projects don't get delayed when customers are looking at short, familiar documentation. And, and the traditional equipment lease is very short, and uh, that does, does not take someone long to, to read through it and sign off. Uh, even the public companies that we've dealt with have not requested a single word change uh, on the traditional lease document. Uh, and that just goes to show how reasonable and standard these provisions are. Okay, we have another question. Does the business owner lessee have to be the owner of the building we place the system on? Uh, not necessarily. Um, and um, as long as the landlord uh, allows the installation and signs something called a landlord waiver, which basically allows the lessor to access the equipment uh, if it has to be serviced or maintained, uh, and also in the event of a default, if it has to be uh, uh, re returned, uh, and, um, and, and therefore the, the business owner does not have to own uh, the building. Uh, when it's a related entity that owns the building, which is typically the case with privately owned companies, you know, the owners of the company have set up a, a realty company, an LLC to own the building and lease it to the operating entity. Both of those entities will be uh, parties to our solar lease. Uh, one is less, lessee, 
and the other one is a guarantor of the lease obligations. Uh, another question, uh, we focus on the US market because our traditional operating lease uh, takes advantage of US tax benefits, which requires uh, the equipment be located and placed in service in the US. Uh, I'm often asked if that would include uh, territories like Puerto Rico or Guam or US Virgin Islands. Unfortunately, uh, we can't go there. So we're talking about mainland US. Uh, we will, however, go to uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, the maximum duration, the, the lease term, uh, is seven years. And again, keep in mind, uh, the the companies that are attracted to our lease want to get in an ownership position quickly. They don't want to be paying rent, which is what a lease is, for an extended period of time. You see 15, 20-year leases on these PPAs, the solar industry leases, where a lot of value is being retained by the provider of those programs, not enough shared with the customer. They only give the customer a nominal reduction in their electric rate. Our program is to provide greater energy savings and more overall value than those programs. And to do that means a quick, uh, affordable path to ownership uh, is, is the way we have uh, the customers achieve those objectives. Uh, appropriateness for a nonprofit or religious organization, sorry, no. Tax law does not allow the lessor to monetize ITC when the lessee is a tax exempt entity. So that rules out those kind of entities. That's why, frankly, you see PPAs proliferating in that marketplace. Although a, a capital lease could be uh, used, uh, again, depending on whether the organization wants to own the system or not. But no, no one takes the uh, ITC in the lease structure with a tax exempt entity. Um, question, do you need three years of financing and good credit? Uh, well, we need good credit. Uh, we're looking for bankable credits, uh, transaction sizes starting just over 150,000 and up. Customers have to provide either two years or three years of tax returns, uh, if not financial statements. Uh, transaction sizes from 100,000 to 150,000. It's a matter of pulling credit reports, personal as well as corporate, and if the credit scores well, uh, we can approve those and, and move forward. Uh, hotels are another area where we're very active. Uh, we've done quite a few uh, motels, different flagged motels. Uh, these are for franchisees, uh, you know, places like Best Western, Quality Inn, et cetera. Those are excellent candidates. Uh, we like them very much. Uh, requirements for an installer contractor working with us, uh, demonstrating experience, uh, installing transactions similar in size or larger to the ones you bring to us, and uh, you know, an acceptable uh, cr financial credit score. Anything else? I think we have a few more minutes. Yeah, Stanley, I'd love to ask you another question. Who pays the insurance, maintenance, and any property taxes when it is a traditional operating lease? Another good question. Thank you, Carly. So these operating leases for equipment are considered triple net, triple net leases, just like what is common in the real estate industry meaning that the lessee is responsible for these costs. Um, the good news is even when taking these costs into consideration, the customer achieves still many times more value when using the traditional operating lease versus a PPA or solar, indu solar industry lease. And contractors have the opportunity to provide a maintenance contract to these customers and generate ongoing revenue stream while uh, maintaining that customer relationship.
Uh, okay, another question. Can storage EV charging roof electric upgrade, transmission upgrade be included in the lease as part of the overall project? The short answer is yes, they can. And uh, happy to talk to you uh, after the webinar about specific uh, costs that you might see in your projects and uh, how we uh, roll them into the, the solar lease. Oregon, yes, we do projects in Oregon. And um, someone asked, what about solar thermal? Yes. Very good question. Solar thermal qualifies also. Same 30% ITC, so the financial metrics are going to be similar. Uh, the contractors will provide us with the energy savings, and we can include that in our cash flow model. Uh, solar thermal definitely qualifies. Great. And although the traditional operating lease is typically for seven years with a monthly payment, that is low and affordable, how might customers conserve cash when exercising a purchase option? Oh, another good question. Well, um, drawing on my 35 plus years experience in the equipment leasing industry, companies are no more inclined to write a check and pay all cash for equipment coming off lease than they were to uh, write a check for new equipment. They finance it in some fashion. And so, uh, a customer uh, can come back to us and apply to, for a loan to finance their buyout at the end of the sixth or seventh year, or they're free to go to any lender in the country if they want a shop rate. Although it usually doesn't come down to what the interest rate, more important is managing cash flow. And depending on the need for cash in the business at that time, the customer will finance it over a, a, a one, two, or three year period. Uh, the objective having a monthly payment the same or lower than what it was during the lease term. And it's a, a strategy, a nine year investment strategy that we refer to as, as lease and loan to own. That's part of how we make the solar project affordable for these customers. Uh, solar carports, absolutely. I love the uh, solar carport. I think it's an elegant uh, use of, of solar. Uh, and we finance a lot of solar carports. Uh, we can also do ground mount as well as roof mounted systems. Uh, solar thermal MPV can be combined on one lease. And uh, we can even include other energy types of equipment uh, on the same lease. Uh, uh, not too long ago, we uh, financed uh, energy uh, generation equipment for Ammer in Illinois. Uh, a New York Stock Exchange listed uh, public utility in front of the meter. Uh, and we had a solar array, a wind turbine, and two natural gas fired generators all on the same seven year lease. The same seven year lease that uh, we offer to all of our customers. All right, we're coming up on the last couple minutes uh, in the webinar. Stan, did you have any other quick questions that you wanted to get to before we? Um, wrap everything up? Well, one very important one that I just want to touch on real quick, and, and again, people who are interested can get copies of these Q&As uh, that we've uploaded uh, to the website. But by doing a lease of a system, it's a better strategy than paying cash or doing a loan if the customer thinks they may be selling the building on which the solar is installed sometime over the first five years of the lease. The, the reason being that uh, when they sell the building, they'll be selling the solar system if they're the first owner of the system, either having paid cash or done a loan, uh, there's a clawback of a portion of that investment tax credit that they claimed. You know, the 30% ITC vests 20% a year. So until the end of the fifth year, that ITC has not fully vested, there'll be a clawback. However, when the customer does the traditional operating lease and they sell the building, that doesn't create a clawback of that value uh, when the 
buyer of the building is credit approved by the lessor to assume the lease. And we've had a couple situations like that come up already and uh, it, it's worked out to everybody's benefit to allow the assignment of the lease. So a much better strategy for that reason than paying cash or doing a loan. Wonderful. Thank you, Stanley, so much for um, coming back on and doing uh, another webinar with us and sharing your insights. Uh, you're welcome, Carly. And uh, again, it's been my pleasure, folks. And keep in mind, when you're talking to these company owners, you want to achieve their other objectives, grow the business, increase profit, and build long-term value. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. We will be sending a recording of the webinar along with the handouts uh, that Stanley has provided for us by the end of the day tomorrow, April 24th. So keep an eye out for that uh, as a registrant of the webinar. And if again, if you have any uh, specific questions for Stanley, his information is provided in the handout section. Um, you can also find him on his website at Greenview Capital. And um, if there's anything else, if you have any questions or concerns regarding the webinar, you can contact ACES at membership at ACES.org. And don't forget, we're offering a special for everyone who's registered for the ACES conference today, 25% off of our professional memberships at ACES.org slash join with promo code ACES webinar. We will be planning uh, a series of webinars hopefully shooting for a minimum of once every two months. So look out for that. You can sign up for our email list on our website as well. And thank you again for joining us. And thank you again to Stanley for, for, for presenting with us today.